Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to thank Unsolicited Press Summer. It has been a great pleasure to work with all of you. Um, I have it's very, been very easy, and I really appreciate that. So I'm going to um, I'm going to read two poems from um, Lens. I'm going to read the first poem, and then I'm going to segue into uh, some other poems that uh, that are true. I'm going to talk about the kinds of triggers that I create my poems from. Uh, and then the very last poem will be the final poem in Lens. Um, and um, gather my thoughts together here. <laughs> the first poem in, in uh, Lens is called High Sierra 1878. And all of the poems in Lens were inspired by artwork of California. So this really is a California book. I'm a, I'm a fourth generation Californian, so it meant a lot to me to, to write these poems. The first one here is, was inspired by a painting called Kings River Canyon by William Keith, in, and he painted it in 1878. High Sierra where they got off the horses, almost rusted to the saddle. How many more days with the high peaks, white drama still before them? The incredible light at Gugaw they tossed between them, altitude skewing thought, changing their words into bubbles and baubles. But creaky joints set down alongside creeks, so knew they dashed and washed the rocks, wet the air, swooped, clattered, roared. No stopping the water. Wasn't that what they came for? Climbing on those horses, abandoning good sense to ride four, five days into this feral, unleashed land, available only in summer. And here they were, subject to its unreasonable solutions. Okay, and moving on to uh, a couple of other poems that were inspired by artwork, but uh, not they are not part of Lens. This is called Attempted Escape, and it was inspired by a painting of Joyce Trimans called Adventure Three. Attempted Escape. He's here again the blonde man in royal blue. It's the 70s and we're embracing color as never before. I'm wearing my would-be toga though I don't know why. I worry about champagne stains. We took the LSD with breakfast and the beach. We didn't realize emptiness would afford no guarantee of safety. After all, we're talking about our minds. I suppose that's the reason I thought the toga would be appropriate. A lot of lying down seemed inevitable, a sheet on the beach. I wore pajamas underneath, my beach togs, my beads. Everyone wears beads. Some are red jade for the healing of broken hearts. The man in the blue suit, the man in the bright red smoking jacket, other persons who are younger than most of us, what did we think we'd escape? Snakes around the ankles, feathers in the hair, linear thinking has given us wrong answers, broken storm cellars. This bleak architecture is all off. Pardons fly out of your hand, O oh blue-coated man. I know you from some small town corner in New York City, where together we painted out that horrible smoke gray racket. We put up arbors, wisteria, visits to the Rockies during the brief, brief summer. We're entering the slipping down of 3 p.m. Okay. The next poem was also inspired by uh, a piece of artwork, this time a ceramic sculpture 
by Lawrence Simon. And it's titled, An Angel Offers Me His Heart. And I titled my poem, The Jester Offers His Heart. There was an excavation into his use of a pig to represent the heart that cannot be resisted. There was an investigation into his choice to assign the pig angelic status. They all tried to parse the meaning of his adopted identity as a ram, object of the pig's amour. Oh, the chaise they lay upon, and how to get the horns out of the upholstery. The difference between their ears, and the moral issue of species interbreeding, and the religious issue of, was this a female pig or a male? Because clearly the goat was a he. And finally, the consideration of appropriate artistic expression. Debated long into the night, January into February, which they all wished was not a foreshortened month. All of them brimful of righteous opinion and plenty of their hosts' best wine. All of them altogether ready to be entertained and titillated by the artist's depiction of indiscriminate animal lust. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jean. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move into a different kind of trigger now. Um, words, I just, I'd love to, you know, have a word come into my mind. And in this case, for this series of poems, I would let the word come into my mind. Then I would look up the, the um, I would look up the definition. So I call these poems definition poems. Oblique, slanting, neither perpendicular nor horizontal, not level or upright, inclined, not straightforward, evasive, disingenuous, underhanded. Throw away all that is not cogent to tomfoolery and the slant approach to the foils and thralls. Of course, parents want to teach their children not to make a commotion in the dinghy of life. Of course, they want them to brush their teeth regularly and always be savvy enough to maintain an, an amiable demeanor with law officers and others in authority. But kids, and adults still related to their own childhood. No, it's necessary to locate the path behind the barn. Important to be able to slip into corner boy lingo if you're passing the corner boys. It's the canny move to learn dance steps that horrify mom and make dad sputter. It's vital to embrace a sense of the berserk when confronted with the fact of the Mexican cartels or the religious leader who straps explosives to the rib cage of a terminally desperate 15 year old saying, you know you're righteous, you know the gates will open for you on the other side and your mother will be there to embrace you in glory now go and kill. Entice. To allure, to lead on by exciting hope of reward or pleasure, to tempt. The tablecloth is orange. Some would say silk. Some would say oil claw. Some would say it doesn't matter. Beautiful. The sunset sky, sound of laughter. Just the right amount of alcohol in the drink. Lift, not fly. What is the music? It wouldn't be Miles' sketches of Spain with its sorrow undertone its images of walking slowly down stone steps alone. No, more Vivaldi or Ellington, 
red Italian poppies or tuxedo and smooth cravat. Still, maybe more innocence than Ellington. Not suave, but not ingenue. A purposeful choice to eschew cynicism, but still awareness that this is incredibly lucky. War being always, as it were, just around the corner. And the offered release in the mind, release from guilt's clench, will be time limited. But oh, what a gift, we'll take it. Slipping off the formal shoes, we choose the Hungarian fiddle player. Hot feeling floods our blood. We're wearing just these thin wraps. We're moving over damp, tamped ground, and our bodies are our friends. Mendacity, the quality of being untruthful, a tendency to lie, a lie. She told me she knew how to correct all her mistakes. She told me she could rid my house of rats. She told me that she won her grammar school jump rope contest four years in a row and was a spelling bee champion. And that book about the spelling bee winner who eventually fathomed the origin of all language, its inception. Well, she told me that book was based on her. And though she didn't want to talk about it, she understood the meaning of life. Not just her own life, but all life. And it had to do with the origins of language because maybe she said she knew, I said I couldn't be sure either that I knew or that she knew. Life was inextricably intertwined with consciousness and that not just humans have consciousness, but everything, dewdrops, rabbits, dragonflies, rocks, has consciousness, therefore life. She said that if she put her mind to it, she could discipline her body to become an Olympic pole vaulting winner. But mostly, she confided, she just wanted to be a cello player. The cello playing equivalent of Coco Pelle, who played the world into being with his spirit flute. But she said she wasn't actually going to do that because the cello was just too cumbersome to lug around. She had to take the bus and people complained. Bungle. An ineffectual action, a botch, gross blunder. When Jack sold the cow for a handful of magic beans, he and his mom were unbelievably lucky that the beans really were magical. This story is attractive to mere mortals because for most of us, most of the time, those beans wouldn't have been magical. Such embarrassment or worse, dire consequences. It's also lucky she threw them out the window and didn't cook them for dinner, the meagerest dinner they'd eaten and the meagerness to continue probably get worse. Jack continued to behave foolishly when he climbed that beanstalk. But what child doesn't want to climb, especially when such a sturdy vine appears to lead to heaven? What child or person? would fail to be tempted to achieve the higher perspective, or maybe the ear of God, or maybe just escape a mother's carping. Better than having to milk the cow, though that would at least fill the stomach. But then, if a beanstalk's really a beanstalk, it's going to have beans to offer. And if it's such a huge bean, 
And if it's such a, excuse me, if it's such a huge stalk, who's to know, but the beans will also be huge. And then even one huge bean taken back to a hungry mother who knows how to cook a bean will make a generous meal for them both. Okay, so let me turn to the final poem in Lens. This will be my final poem to read to you tonight. And this was inspired by a painting by Paul Jossi, a contemporary American painter. And he called his painting September Song. I call my poem September. Right there on the whorl, the colors utter a repose to wind's lacrimal wooing. Plenty of people pass by without even hearing the ongoing talk where leaves percolate, deer crackle, and malingerer lizard dreams an, an, an enduring lecture that explains the nature of the sun on 16 different days. He's so tired, yet there are these requirements of worship again and again. The time comes when branches droop, begin to doubt the truth of sun at all. That's when lizard has retired into the phantasmagoria of cold despair and cannot help, but still, there is sound. Skunk wears the robe of night. Raccoon wears the mask. They rub against the trees in passing. That's when a great sigh penetrates even the stone lizard sleeps under. Thank you. I appreciate everything that you've done for the book and I appreciate everybody that showed up tonight. Uh, I saw some familiar names, Jen, Jordan, Hannah, Summer. Thank you for stopping by, Susan. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll start probably about as differently as uh, I could imagine. Um, if it's okay with you, Summer, the first poem I'm gonna read is the title poem of the collection. And <clears throat> there is a, it was, run online and I was going to put the link to it just because for this first poem I thought it'd be amusing for folks to be able to see the lines while I read. Um, I always I, I am a little bit more even though I'm at a poetry reading right now I am definitely more of a visual uh, writer and reader if you know I know there was there's been a big push ever since the uh, late 70s, early 80s, that you know, poetry is only poetry, it's read aloud. Uh, but there's so much that happens on the page that um, I like to be able to see things sometimes. So the, this is the title poem, and then I'll talk for just a second about why the book is called what it is, and we'll go from there. In the New Crusades, we underwent a series of tests. We underwent the rain as we tried to find the right bridge with pigeons and the sign that said, fuck me, I loved her, my blood is in the water. And we underwent the bridge and we wore the rain like a glass coffin that made us gorgeous by magnifying every pore. So I think that this collection came together as a reaction to, um, <laughs> I'm old, ish uh and i i didn't come to social media till fairly late in the game um and i had been going on a lot of runs in an area where there's a lot of really interesting graffiti near our house and i don't know there was just all these like things that i would see as graffiti messages like in the poem i just read the section in the middle there's just a direct quote from a graffiti message um and it felt to me very much like the experience of seeing like a you know a, a feed of, of messages from, you know, folks that you don't know exactly what 
is going on in their life. But sometimes you see this sort of heart wrenching thing or this really upsetting thing or really offensive thing. Um, and the collection started sort of like collecting facts and collecting, you know, these, these statements out of the abyss from graffiti, from uh, social media. And it, it went from there. So um, the, the title was this idea about like all these sort of <laughs> large scale political crusades folks are on. And then it's, it's balanced by poems that go to the opposite direction and talk about, you know, the, some of the crusades that maybe we're on internally as individuals that don't connect to some larger movement. So this one's called All Night Newsfeed. Here I take the box of world to watch its fevers grow, its governance by owls, those eyes that glow all night like laundromats. I see the way it carries me, its hooks, the eulogy of snow. By common law, I'm stuck steep above my own life or below, the way these prepositions don't mean anything if you're far enough away. The owls skirt the rags of light from town, grave shifters, insomniacs, those too numb to sleep. There's a bonfire in the snow and girls and drinks and the light that is itself a prayer if prayer is an answer more than a question for the sable silvered clouds. Dark is the night by Willie Johnson catechizes space and waves as American madness raves in echoic elementary schools. Don't go, don't go, I hear them say. November dangles like an ornament. Dust rises off us like crowns of fathers that say our sons will kill us all. They stopped talking long ago. And I am claimed by distant touch, by the rumor of fern from the first snow, still telling the old stories of the world. It's not a snow globe. It's not to be shaken. Someone's racket of life is in there. That someone is me, you owl, you king of end credits and coal mouth glow. Uh, so, um, hopefully those first two give that sense of like, you know, what, <laughs> what the feed life does to one. Um, and, you know, the, I think there's, there's necessarily uh, a reaction to that to go sort of severely internal in reaction to that <laughs> barrage of what is coming from the outside. This one, is, this one is called, Soon a Hatch Will Open and a Man with a Gun Will Ask You Why You're Not a Man. Often on your way home, there's a woman in a lavender blouse carrying groceries or a taxi driver learning the streets like his convalescing wife's ribs. And often school's letting out its pollen of mouths singing, I want nothing, I want nothing. And beyond the internet's black dress of infinite interior monologue, frost crusts maple leaves and the sea deep in its away begins the weather to end us. A telephone pole reads, do not leave kids unattended in this wind. The weather grows like a black lilac. Someone hurt someone. It all began on TV. The man with the gun will tell you to behave. You ask the gun which country it's from. From the heartland, it says. I don't make the rules, it says. You don't know anyone. You don't know your crimes. But a man in a suit of blood comes to tell you who's won, how winning is done. It doesn't matter what you did, that your daughters braided each other's hair like sheaves of cinnamon, that your wife slept against your left arm on the couch, her breath a valence around you, that you never finished raking the leaves. You could give a speech, he'd like that. You could say you don't deserve this. He'd say, who does? The light asks for your soliloquy, its hunger a bladed pendulum, a burnt village. In the background, someone is watching reruns. You take off your jacket to wait in this shared pornography. You don't remember being human, holding your voice in a time without a savior. You remember only a mountain buried in your chest and then removed. There are, you recall, mountains burning in the news, a fire wounded forest, its sacrificial smoke rising to touch rare birds 
who live thinly between fact and myth, who rise winged as if to be prayed to, as if to rule without laws. Um, so the collection is in a few sections and uh, the bulk of the poems are um, these epistolary poems to this, it's this character who's kind of referred to as, as the conglomeration of whatever American morning and whatever American evening is. So like, for example, they all start dear something, something, something American morning. This one is dear curtained American morning at the cliff of spring. The CIA reads 5 million tweets a day. Do you have such mirrors? Does the sea do to you what it does to me or to the current resident? Lake view, gloom, distant fire pit, moored boats translate fiercely all night. We are here forever. Help me, the floating bottle said anonymously. Dear, do you pray? Have you changed your mind? Help me help myself, all for a value you won't find anywhere else. Certain architecture first edition, the returned voice of a dead singer. Why do you give such hints all along? Can I grow toward you? Can we listen to time together? There are castles still with restaurants where a thousand lobsters die. Dear, familiarize yourself with the nearest fire exit. Do you see us if you are us? Oh. And there's like a, so again, there's a morning and an evening section of those. And this is one more from that morning section. Dear stay at home dad, American morning. I spy a flat tired Subaru in the neighbor's yard. Weekdays after 9 a.m. no one is alive. I checked all the houses, I checked my own. I spy up into the sky an abandoned piano in the road experiencing deja vu. The insurance is good. They gave the disease to rats long enough to get the medicine right. It's November 1st, but it hasn't snowed. I spy a moth floating from clover to clover. I thought I was so smart, so progressive to say there was no God when I was 14 and the doctors made it feel so ordinary. These days, take someone's heart completely out they can and set it on a table, do some work. I spy a dog running without a plan, the well at my grandparents' house in my mind. I haven't seen it in years, opening and closing like a bat's mouth, shooting out sound to find me. So some are my, I don't know about yours, but I am also a parent of young ones and my life is also a mess. So <laughs> I have just a giant pile of papers here. I also spooked myself because I'm on East Coast time and I got super caffeinated around five o'clock and I was like, I am ready to go. And then I realized it was three hours later. <laughs> uh, so, there's there are a few poems that have this like three column structure um and one of the things i enjoy about these is i try to read them differently um at different readings so you know you can read them first column down second column down third column down or you can read them straight across horizontally or sometimes i'll go like you know top left quadrant then middle quadrant then bottom right quadrant so this poem I'm gonna read twice. Uh, the, it's called The Body Begs to Believe. And it's the same, you know, the same page of words. I'm just reading it two different versions. So here's number one. The body begs to believe, but there it is in boxes. We are known by our systems, by our signs, by large invisible beasts. The sign says, Stay awake, stay alive. On a bathroom floor, the body's nail clippings spell prayers, the prayer of windows, the prayer of blinds. 
The sign outside says, stop. The sign says, merge. The sign says, no one can know a system by knowing its discrete parts. Light parts from the sheeted body and its knowing. Windows write in an alphabet of crosses. Nowhere is a body worth more as disembodied eyes, liver, kidney. Boxes of limbs wait in a sigh of hospital rooms, begging for a body, for a belief system, for a light to bend the sky down to earth. So this is the same poem, just read horizontally instead of vertically. But there it is on a bathroom floor in boxes, a body's nail clippings, spell windows, prayers, write in an alphabet of crosses, the prayer of windows, the prayer of blinds. We are known by our systems, by our signs. The sign outside says stop. Nowhere is a body worth the sign. More large and visible beasts says merge. The sign says no as disembodied eyes deliver. No one can know a system by knowing its discrete parts. Kidney, light parts from the sheeted boxes of limbs wait in a sigh of hospital rooms begging for a body. A belief, the sign says, stay awake, stay alive, a system for light to bend the sky and it's knowing down to earth. So uh, I think that probably also, you know, gives you a sense of my commitment to visual elements of the page because that doesn't, you know, that's hard to visualize that in some ways unless you read it more than once. Um, so, let's see. This one is another one of those ones that I think uh, <laughs> if your introduction were any kind of warning, hopefully this earns that. Uh, the latest science, only the facts we said. You could have been a man. I think I'm only a window, he said. Only the articulate wild. Fought like a man, we said. Fought like a man. I'm broke, he said. A bag of debt. A real bag of shit, we said. A day without balls. I don't even know the rules, he said. How to owe. Mortgage, car, energy, water, we said. Phone, school, insurance. Yes, he said, growing smaller. I was betrayed. Work harder, we said. Try spreading your legs. I'm sorry, he said. I have a diary full of apologies. The bank was decorated, he said, in big, bold Christmas lights. You could have had a bigger dick, we said. Some abs. Doesn't work make you, he said, lonely? Don't be simple, we said. Don't be dated. I'm sorry, he said. I'm just a window. Overtime, we said, will help blank, he said. It was just, I had an idea about the sky. There's no sky, we said. Newsfeed science just said so. Blank, he said. Blank. Uh, oh, thank you, Summer. This is one of the ones from the later American evening section. Dear gospelized American evening. Oh, yeah, that one. Sorry. Tired of sleeping alone, light ovulates above tunneling star nose moles that meet only to mate and that by giving off a terrified high-pitched shriek. What's your emergency? Your story's told in stained glass, but God's an elephant dressed in diamonds. I, state your name, want to write the gospel of Springsteen and flammable hair products on the street and light it when all the fatalistic windows furl dark. I, state your name, understand art as a process of being sold. This is a contract and it hurts like one. The terror of requited and required love is quaking in such small whimpers all around you. The street is a fire with light that might be language 
if you could read your own world. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'll do just one, maybe two more summer. I don't know what you're thinking in terms of wrapped up here. Good. All right, so this is, a, this is a fitting one because this uh, came after a bus trip from New York to California. So there, there's a <laughs> attempt to connect to Grace's California poems here. This is called Nothing Ends Until We Want It To. I have what I want, which makes me a target. I have what I want, which makes me a ghost. So let me tell you something I miss. Thrift flannels, mosh hair, fields of goldenrod, alfalfa, grass without name. And in it, that friend who called collect one night in a blizzard after two years of silence and said, I need a ride to rehab. And no, I said, I've got a daughter now, work in the morning. Seven mile runs up Jackson Hollow, weekends without clocks, football on the high school fields, palimpsest of loneliness. And then the news of one pickup just sulking all owl-eyed night like a hay bale past harvest. That friend slumped over the steering wheel. I miss 16 out in the woods, each of us climbing Connecticut Hill in the leafy dark by heart, a case of stolen blue. And then the fire, the heat of the fifth, the way we stood in the cradle of pines and saw each other shadow armored and said everything we knew could be forgiven the next day with false amnesia. I miss dogwood slurring slow goodbyes as I began to understand that contrary to the law of identity, I could be myself and an understudy. And that friend whose father threw him through the front door into the neighbors grunted, you can have him, whose mother made meth of medicine and whispered, it'll all be okay. Listen, once on a bus to Los Angeles, the driver fell asleep and we moved up front to tell near-death stories to keep the guy awake and save us all. Later, we got high and he said, I think I'm becoming a hole for everyone to fall through. And layers of dark catechized barn rafters and water towers. And then the blue black and last howls and first crows. And we were past life, past death, a song on a loop in the smoke of fatigue. But this morning, I walk a fog as a junked car across the street fills with snow. A wealth of things I thought would happen didn't. What I wanted calls me its target, its ghost. There are rules, but I don't know them. My point is I want all my friends and enemies back, even the meth head with his worried German shepherd, even the racist neighbor with his dementia-plagued mother. My point is I forgot I used to be nothing as I watched the red leaves decorate the river blessed with so many fish we could live on only their eyes. Once we got high and I said, I dreamed I was a king and a wolf and fought myself and lived. After all, if a man cannot live nobly, he can die the same as anyone. And that one who did two years for drunken robbery and bought me tacos the night he went in. And that one I thought of when later I sat in the warm chairs of the university library reading about Thebes and ancient Greece who were sent into the wild to survive for two years and returned or didn't. That wild of Io and Zeus, of Pentheus and Iphigenia, Foxfire and Salt Sea. Their mothers asked nothing, their fathers offered daggers. Um, <clears throat> I'll do just one more to wrap up. Uh, so this one, this one I think is maybe my favorite poem of my own if we have those. Um, I had to pay my wife $100 for this poem because <laughs> she, I, I don't really think too much about, you know, I, this is an ethical problem of my own, I guess. But I don't think too much about how my writing affects other people when I write about, you know, people who are close to me. But uh, my wife saw that this had been published online and she looked at me sideways and I said, I will give you all of the money that I got for publishing that poem. <laughs> so uh, I'll end with this one, which is called, I Don't Believe in Ghosts. Apologize for my disorganization.
<laughs> Maybe I won't end with this one. Give me two seconds for commercial break. Okay? This is what happens when instead of a podium, I have a couch iron I'm working with. Dun, dun, dun. I don't believe in ghosts. Let's say you were ready for bed in your brown rim glasses with your black yoga pants and your loose green sweatshirt. For you, I would shovel the driveway in the dark, the unsolvable ice under the curdled snow, and I would scrape your windshield and warm your car. I'm trying so hard to explain myself. I am trying so hard to avoid words like love as if they were long clouds ruining safe flights over America's bidriff. I am trying not to put you in the usual gardens. The important thing is you were always quiet about matters like this, always willing to let certain phenomenon be observed only. I'm fond of the scar on your ass where they took that mole there are times I put your shirts away and feel how light you are. And that's it for me.